Hello and welcome to the 29th booty book tag here on Literary Gladiators. This is Josh, and today I have a very special guest, our longtime top fan, Don Levy. Thank you. It's a Glad pleasure. to be here. It's a pleasure to have you on board. And the, uh, the story- I appreciate it. Pleasure is mine. Uh, and the story behind uh, Don and I doing this tag is that uh, Don had proposed meeting up one time uh, and doing a foodie book tag. And the food that he had in particular was breakfast food. So I promised him and I promised myself that I would put this one aside until uh, you and I were able to do this together. So. I'm finally going to uh, make it happen, and we are yes. presenting you with the breakfast book tag. Sounds good. Already, uh, I put together uh, 17 questions uh, or prompts, and uh, the very first one was uh, based off of uh, a prompt idea that you, Don, uh, presented me with, uh, and uh, the that prompt is for pancakes, uh, a light but syrupy work that sticks with you. And me personally, I chose something that is light in the fact that it is accessible, not in the fact that it is a uh, uh, heavy subject matter. Uh, this one really sticks with you. Uh, and it is a short story that I first discovered from the best American short stories from 2018. And that is The Art of Losing by uh, Yun Choi. Uh, it originally appeared in New England Review and it pertains to an older man who has, uh, who's dealing with Alzheimer's and he's beginning to, uh, he's mentally, he's beginning to mentally decline, but yet he still has that uh, sense of yearning as far as wanting to accomplish things in life is concerned. And it's, uh, you, you get his wife's perspective and the response of everybody within the family, it is very uh, sentimental and does stick with you. Oh, that sounds really good. Yeah, it certainly is. Uh, we discussed it on our channel back in season 10. It was uh, one of the discussions that really stuck with me, one of the works that really stuck with me. Uh, what was your uh, choice, Don? Uh, I don't know if it's sugary. Or syrupy, that's what you said. But uh, I like books that sort of sweet, and I don't have any copies, but um, it's Cannery Row by um, John Steinbeck. Oh, okay. Cannery Row, it's just these, it takes place during the Depression, so there's this little community of uh, people, homeless people who live on the beach. There's uh, Doc, who is a marine biologist, and these guys want to help Doc, so they have a party, but it gets out of hand. But it is, it's very light, I think, but it, it gives you a sense of community, you know, and uh, it's an enjoyable um a um, novel, short, short novel. I could imagine. I know uh, with John Steinbeck, his uh, works can take on pretty heavy subject matter, uh, be it the grapes of wrath uh, of mice and men, uh, mm -hmm. East of Eden, even. Uh, but uh, what you're saying is that Cannery Row is a little bit more lighthearted in its nature, or is it light in the reading experience? No, I'm, I mean, to me, it's one of my favorite Steinbeck novels. Um, maybe because it isn't as heavy, you know, it's not as dark as like Of, of Mice and Men or um, 
the great Saras. Then I would um, imagine. But, I would imagine that yeah, it's, Henry Rowe, it's a good way to get into Steinbeck. I you're trying to say. I think so. Already. Uh, the next prompt is Waffles, uh, an organized collection of works. Uh, what did you choose for this one, Don? Well, I was thinking about it, and what struck me is like um, Agatha Christie, because she wrote a series of novels with uh, Hercule Poirot, who's this um, famous Belgian um, detective, and you have Miss Marple, who is a little lady who seems to be anywhere there's a murder, and she's very good at solving it. Um, mm -hmm. Also, she uh, Agatha Christie wrote Miss uh, No um, romantic romance books under the name Mary Westcott. So I think she had her career compartmentalized you know, in compartments, and she knew, okay, this is going to be a Perot book, this is going to be a Marple book. And she's very prolific, and it really did pay off. Uh, one of the, the only works that have been published more than hers are the Bible and Shakespeare. So, uh, really, uh, really sorted out. Um, well, I've read, I've read a lot of them in high school and junior high. Oh, so okay. I'm, I'm still a big fan. For leisure? What? For leisure? Oh, yes. I, you know, I mean, uh, they're just fun. I, they're fun books. Okay. And she's really good at the twists and turns. She really don't know who the murderer is until right. the very end. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, people are beginning to go over her works at, on a more academic level, but uh, I would imagine that uh, that took quite some time. Uh, but uh, my pick is Martha Stewart's Vegetables, which is a cookbook that uh, it's a cookbook of uh, Martha Stewart recipes, uh, covering vegetables of all kinds. Uh, she has it sorted out into different kinds of vegetables, uh, bulbs, roots, tubers, greens, fruit. It's just a wide array. And each of them, uh, she has uh, different recipes for each. She, for the most part, each has a, uh, an organized picture and it's sorted out very well. Uh, and I cooked quite a few recipes from this cookbook, uh, one of which we did on our channel. Uh, but I have to say the, um, the pictures are really beautiful. I wish I probably did eat more veggies. I, this really is enticing and I think it will encourage you to eat more veggies. Uh, the uh, kale and ricotta dip is amazing. Uh, I We had the Swiss chard lasagna that was in here. And there was a recipe with, uh, oh, mustard green pasta we had. And then another one with uh, a bucatina. Uh, bu uh, Bucatini. Uh, I'll have oh, a bucatini with cauliflower, capers, and lemon. Oh, I like I like capers and lemon. Mm -hmm. That sounds enticing. Not a big capers fan, but I do like the uh, the cauliflower, and I think the lemon zest was pretty intriguing. I think it was... Yeah, I think Capers is a um, acquired taste. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just like just like olives. Uh, olives to me, it seems like you have to have a taste for it, and I do not. Me either. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Already, the next one is eggs, 
a work that can be read and interpreted in different ways, which I could have gone with uh, the Bible for this one once again, but I don't want to use the same response to everything that's within the ballpark of that. But I went with something that uh, tries to interpret the Bible, uh, and that is East of Eden by John Steinbeck. And this is often viewed as a modern day retelling of the book of Genesis. And I think there's a lot that you can examine beyond that because it brings up some very interesting points about the story of Cain and Abel, and then incorporates some other things that have been uh, attributed to the Bible, uh, such as the story of Lilith, which I uh, gathered details from the History Channel's discussion about uh, stories that were omitted from the Bible or were uh, uh, pieces that were withheld from the Bible. Uh, and I think that there's a lot to examine as far as the way that it makes the connections. So uh, that would be my choice for that prompt. Okay. I was thinking, I'm thinking more of a genre than a book. And I would say poetry. Okay. That is it. Because I... I know from my own personal, um, because I read poetry, and when I read it, people have come to me with different interpretations that I didn't think of. And I think a lot of poetry, you could go over something like uh, The Wasteland, or even something simpler, like um, Amy Lowell's Patterns. And like, what is the author, the poet trying to say? Mm -hmm. And I think people will come up with different ideas for it. I do like that yeah. approach. And it seems like in my mind that the only thing that can be deemed as official is if the poet themselves says that it's official, but otherwise everything else is up for debate. And as long as you have a strong enough uh, argument, then your argument is legitimate. Well, it's interesting when like, people have to me. I'm like, oh, I think you did see something in my book that I didn't see. That's, that was my intent. But that's the great thing about poetry, that there's really no one right answer. I mean, you can find, like, who is the protagonist in Hamlet? And you have really one answer. Yes. But with poetry, it's very, sometimes it's even very ambiguous mm -hmm. or abstract, and you come up with your own interpretation. And even in poetry, for the most part, for instance, going on your example about Hamlet, uh, uh, what did the uh, what did the Raven quote in Edgar Allan Poe is of course never more. However, what one is trying to uh, get out out of the the mood and maybe the uh, inspiration and background and motives of a piece and even a prose piece like the Telltale Heart. Uh, but I think that with poetry it is especially the way that it is executed is always up for uh, interpretation. Uh, the uh, next prompt is serial. A work or writer you feel benefits from great advertising and press. I guess I'm up. <laughs> yep. Um, you know, I sort of interpret it like um, who's very popular very now. And I have to admit, I haven't read her, 
but Sally Rooney mm -hmm. seems to be everywhere. I'm on Bookstagram, mm -hmm. which is um, the part of Instagram that is about books, and a lot of people seem to be her fans. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, it's hard for me because some of the her title, I think she has one book called Beautiful People or Ordinary People, and I'm like, okay, seems very generic, and the covers look very cartoonish. Um, but, you know, I really would like to one day read it, and who knows whether we will be talking about her 20 years from now. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I did. I've heard of Sally Rooney and I've heard of beautiful people. Uh, and uh, we have a literary gladiators has a what you call a bookstagram, but uh, we don't use it as much as we should. Uh, I'm a bit stronger with uh, booktube and Goodreads, uh, but uh, Sally Rooney, it's interesting because I haven't heard her name as much within uh, mass market uh, book selling. Uh, and I guess I not as much as far as booktube or bookstagram is concerned, uh, but I guess it depends on uh, what your crowd of people is preaching and who they feel is uh, getting a lot of in, uh, attention. Uh, well, I, you know, it's sort of like if for a while everyone was posting books about her. I mean, posting uh, pictures of her books, and I'm like, okay. This, and I know she was not, one of her books was nominated for um, um, the Booker Prize. And she's pretty young. I think she's uh, like 27, which is amazing. She's written oh. three books. She's younger than I am then. I'll have to look into her. Much uh, younger than I am at uh, 61. Mm -hmm. You uh, all are babies to me. <laughs> uh, not necessarily. Uh, there's people that are right. Stephen King's older than you are. <laughs> but, and my pick is also older than you are. Uh, I'm going with uh, uh, a pretty generic answer but i think it's the probably the most uh, appropriate answer uh, and that's james patterson because uh james patterson actually has advertisements on television for his books uh but he uh he comes out with several books a year uh, probably only one of them he writes per year most of the others he'll have a co-writer uh, write and he'll incorporate his finishing touches and stamp his name in big letters on the cover, larger than the title. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I think that the first thing I think of when it comes to uh, mass production and writing, I think of James Patterson. That's true. And didn't he do a book with President Carter? A Clinton. Right one? Um, I mean, a Clinton. Yeah, he, he wrote a, he, uh, I think it was The President is Missing. Yes. And, and there were books that continued the series, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but I, I think that's an interesting combination. Yeah, all those, I don't know, those books don't sort of appeal to me because they seem masked, you know, assembled. Like, mm -hmm. here's the idea, I'll throw it to some young person who can type it up, and I'll just, okay, this and that, and change things around. To me, that's not really writing, but, mm -hmm. you know, it. whatever works for him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I reckon so. Uh, he's making out with it, uh, but oh, that's, very much. that seems to be the way of that people just team up and come up with an idea right under a particular brand like uh, 
like with Tom Clancy in his universe, uh, or they'll do it under somebody that it's almost as if the person has become a market, which I don't necessarily like that because I think that writing is about the individual expressing themselves, their ideas, and uh, exam and being able to demonstrate their imagination. Uh, and it's not supposed to be about continuing a brand of what someone else has previously put together. Right. I like, it. and that's sort of why why his books don't appeal to me. They sound almost all the same. Pretty much so. Much. Alex Cross is where he excels best, and then I think his earlier works were also uh, pretty good. Uh, but then he got to the point where everything seemed to be the same, and also the same. Uh, kind of structure that you see in all kinds of thrillers and mysteries and detective works and whatnot. Yeah, I don't see him trying something different and writing something, a new kind of book for himself. He doesn't seem to challenge himself. Mm -hmm. But he makes money, so... Yeah, it's pretty much... And I'm not. <laughs> oh, mm -hmm. Unfortunately. Hopefully... Hopefully that changes. Hopefully you have a poetry collection come out and you can uh, make yourself big. Maybe. Supposedly uh, in the U.S. the average book of poetry only sells 300 copies. <laughs> yeah, that's unfortunate. That's pretty sad. Yes, it is. I mean, the good thing is that poetry seems to be getting themselves... It, it seems to be getting attention again. I think that with works such as uh, uh, Rupee Carr's Milk and Honey, I think uh, Amanda Lovelace's The Princess Saves Herself in this one and other uh, poetry collections, I think that the uh, this uh, feminist wave really helped it out too. Plus, uh, there's a lot of poetry if you go online. Mm -hmm. of uh, poets at different readings, which I think is great. That's, you know, new people you've never heard of. I loved, in the beginning of this year, uh, Amanda Gorman, who was the um, young poet, mm -hmm. gave a beautiful poem at the inauguration of Biden, and it was beautiful, and she took me away. Mm -hmm. With Ellen. She def it definitely did give her that sense of uh, recognition. Uh, I heard that the someone had said that the collection was not as good as they would have expected it, but she did have that major moment where she uh, struck a strong chord uh, during the uh, the reading at the Biden administration, uh, which. It's just being being able to make it to that point where you partake in uh, the uh, ringing in of a new president is uh, remarkable in itself. Uh, like Maya Angelou in 1993, only she was more polished. It was amazing was she... She didn't look a bit nervous. She was like, oh, I do this every day. You're talking she about was amazing to me. Amanda Gorman? Her, her and her words and her pose. Oh. I just loved it all. Okay. Alrighty then. Uh, the next prompt is for Bacon. Uh, a writer you find as the closest thing to perfect. And I chose Ray Bradbury because he covers so much ground his writing can can uh, be placed in any genre, and the way that he speaks is very uh, eloquent. Uh, the way that he writes, he's outstanding when it comes to crafting words. I read a lot of him in junior high and high school too, mm -hmm. and I, I agree with you. He's such a 
he transcends genres. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, Fahrenheit 451, you initially see it as science fiction, uh, then you could see it as dystopian, but then now it's also, it's being studied, which, and rightfully so, because it really makes you think. And I think that that's exactly what he's trying to get out. Uh, the same thing with the Martian Chronicles. Uh, and then his, you have his shorter works. You have Something Wicked This Way Comes is a horror work that was deemed as the direct inspiration to Stephen King's It. Well, I remember reading uh, the Martian Chronicles you know, when I was like 13 or 14, 15, and I was just amazed by it. Mm -hmm. You know, it really spoke to me. And I think that's why he's been popular for all these years. Mm -hmm. I, read it, I read it twice, and I really, uh, I think reading it the second time, I got a lot out of it. And it says a lot about society and about human nature. And the way that they uh, they seem to act with this sense of group thinking, where everybody wants to go to, everybody is eager to go up to Mars, but then something happens, and they're eager to uh, make them uh, make them make their way back to Earth uh, because of everything going on. Just that brute mentality that it gets planted and then it spreads. Yeah, it, it's amazing. I always remember that one point where this guy is, you know, the planet's pretty much empty at this point and he keeps making phone calls and he gets someone on the other end and he has to travel mm -hmm. all over the planet to find that person. You know, this was the guy, he was looking for a date, if I'm not, that was, yeah, the guy, he wanted a date, and he finds somebody who is just as desperate and not able to find uh, somebody herself, uh, but yeah, I remember that part. My favorite chapter is The Taxpayer, I think uh. that was hysterical. <laughs> the one who, and then uh, I read a couple of years ago, um, Dandelion wine. I read that. Uh, yeah, I read that I read, quite a bit. Yep. He sort of caught, captured the feeling of being the young and innocence of these children back then. I think it, yeah, it really, that gave us a great glimpse of his ability to uh, approach literary fiction and uh, recalling his past, which it was definitely, it was a beautiful piece. And it really did capture the young and the innocent. Uh, have you read Farewell Summer? I don't think so. <laughs> it's the sequel to Dandelion Wine. No, I haven't. Okay. And what I thought was interesting too about Dandelion Wine takes place in summer of 1929. Mm -hmm. And the stock market crash was in October. Mm -hmm. So I think it lends more also like this innocence mm -hmm. before everyone realized what was going on. Mm -hmm. Granted, and I, I think that was de deliberate on his part, I'm sure. Oh, because mm -hmm. yeah, Bradbury would be nine at that time. And the book came out in the 50s, so... It is a very wild, uh, but then again, a farewell summer must takes it, it would must take place at the end of that summer. I don't recall the uh, shadow of the Great Depression, but I'll have to check into that a little bit more. I think it was pretty much contained. Uh, with the topic, uh, kind of like with Something Wicked This Way Comes also examines uh, childhood innocence. 
but that one takes the backdrop of uh, a traveling carnival as opposed to a, uh, a, a free and happy summer. Uh, but uh, who was your choice for the bacon? My choice, and bacon is one of my favorite favorite uh, dishes. Oh, me <laughs> too. I chose one of my favorite writers, Willa Cather. Mm. To me, her writing is so sublime. Um, her novels about the Midwest are f fantastic, like uh, Oh, Pioneer. I love My Antonia is my favorite book of all time. Oh, wow. And, and uh, what is the uh, A Lost Lady is another one. Mm -hmm. And she just. She captures the whole, she's one of those great artists who can, she writes about the landscape. I remember. You can see it in your mind. I remember reading uh, Maya Antoinette and uh, I, I remember being uh, immersed with the atmosphere that she put together. And I've learned, I, Learn that she re she wrote so many more things, and yet I don't know why I never got to them just yet. I would like to get to them at some point, though. And uh, she just I think it's because well I respond is how sublime her her writing is, and mm -hmm. even in the book that's not you know uh, mm -hmm. last year I read Alexander's Bridge, and it takes place mostly in New York and London. Which is not, you could tell she didn't have the love of it, the area that she mm -hmm. did of the Midwest. Mm -hmm. And still, it was a very good book. It was, it was well worth reading, and her style was just emerging. It was her first novel. So she sort of was finding her voice. Um, but it was still a pretty good book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that writers do best when they're writing what they know and can contribute. Uh, it's a bit more challenging when they have to incorporate, uh, when they have to do a little bit more research or uh, write based off of uh, things that they gather. Uh, but the fact that she could still excel in that is still a pretty uh, hefty accomplishment, even if it's not necessarily something that they have uh, a great deal of heart in. Uh, but the uh, next prompt is Canadian bacon, AKA pork roll or Taylor ham. <laughs> uh, a work that sets up heated debate. Well, for me, one of the books that is, it's considered classic, but it's a hard book to really reconcile, um, is Lolita mm -hmm. by uh, Nabokov. Mm -hmm. Because I've heard people say, oh, this is about a man's obsession. But this man's obsession is about little girls, mm -hmm. which is nauseating, you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I read it. It's very well written. Uh, it has a sort of wicked European sense of humor to it. And it's sort of a satire. I mean, he talks about going off, he goes off with Lolita. I think his name is Humber Humbert or something Humber, like Humber. that. Yes, thank you. And he goes around the country. It, all these different like hotels and motels um, but still I, I think it left me cold because of the subject matter mm -hmm. that is a tough one because it something could be but all said and done Humbert Humbert is a pedophile and, Definitely. and no matter how beautiful he says something, his actions are not justified. No. 
No, and, and, and it's disgusting. And yeah. I mean, he's not mm -hmm. like idolizing this girl. He, yeah, it is definitely sexual in nature, and it's to me very disgusting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, I mean, I'm glad that I read it. I know what it's about. I can talk about the book mm -hmm. because I read it, but I, I will have to say it's pretty unsavory to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, Nabokov is just, uh, he's an extraordinary writer. He's an extraordinary thinker. Uh, he's one of the renowned uh, literature instructors, uh, had very noteworthy students. Uh, I gather his lectures were well attended, like everyone wanted to hear him, what he had to say about literature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they even, my copy of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, or The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, uh, the introduction is a uh, Nabokov lecture about The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So he is, he does have a renown to him. Uh, for my choice, I went with Act Without Words 2 by Samuel Beckett because there is that debate as to whether or not the book or whether or not the play uh, has a sense of reason to it in how it uh, examines uh, the cycle of life or a day in the life, or is it pointless? Uh, which I would say that it is an interesting uh, concept of uh, a day in one's life, and uh, I mean, it's the type of the the sequence is very dull. The way that it is, the way that uh, things are taking place is pretty dull. But uh, Beckett is very simplistic with the way that he uh, approaches theater and humanity. Uh, it's very. It, it's very, it, it's very odd, but at the same time, it's very, there's logic to it. You know, I had a um, drama teacher who was really into um, Beckett, Ionesco, mm -hmm. and so I got some of my love of the uh, theater of absurd from him. Mm -hmm. um, we did a play, uh, uh, he directed us in a play, me, this guy, high, high school guy, you know, we were in high school and this girl who's just watching us and me and this other guy are in like potato sacks, basically rolling around on the stage. Mm. And I don't know really what that meant. You know, I think it was like a play without words. Uh, okay. I think that was the title of it. I know that Act Without Words 2 was the one where the, it's two people, uh, a goad pokes one of them, and they do come out of a, like a potato sack, and one of them has a dull, uh, miserable approach to life, where, while the other one is very spry and uh, optimistic about what life has to offer. So it could very well be that one. Yeah, I mean, some of his plays do interest me, like, uh, I have to admit, I wish I read more plays. I haven't done that in a number of years, but, like, Kraft's Last Tape, mm. and, which is a guy who's talking in the tape recorder uh, about his life, that sounds like an interesting play. It, it was it was quite thought-provoking, and it does say a lot, not just about him talking about his life in the recorder, but the process of him doing so and how one is going to often second guess themselves and then go back and want to redo it. And just the mechanics of that. And that's what Beckett is good at is depicting the mechanics and uh, humanity behind how something gets done, not just 
what it is that gets done. Already, the next one is toast. What do you read when you want to read something quick? And for me, uh, it would be reference. Just something that I can uh, look at and uh, digest pretty quickly. Uh, for instance, uh, I have uh, the, Wall of the World Almanac where I can just flip to a page and gather some information. And that would be that. Well, that sounds fun. I remember as a kid, I read the Book of Lists. That was a very popular mm -hmm. book where they compiled all sorts of crazy lists. That um, would be something right up my alley. Yeah, you would love it. Uh, mm -hmm. Jay, um, Wallace, I remember. I forget his first name. I want to say Irving Wallace. Mm -hmm. um, but he compiled them. Mm -hmm. with the book of lists. I think you would love that. Oh, okay. What did for you me, choose? Yeah. For me, it's mystery novels. Mm. Going back to like Agatha Christie. Most of them are pretty short. And to me, I find them relaxing. Mm -hmm. I mean, no one's out to murder me, so. <laughs> but they are relaxing. They're a lot of fun to try to figure out if you can outsmart the author. Mm -hmm. um, earlier this year, I read um, Eleanor Queen. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed it. I don't know if it's the first one I ever read, because I read a lot of mystery novels when I was younger. And now I have, you know, I can't remember some of the books that I read when I was younger. Mm -hmm. You know, but uh, I do like a good mystery novel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say uh, cozy mysteries in particular really uh, attract people. Uh, but I do, I like the, I like to see how, uh, whether or not I'm able to figure out the conclusion and how quickly it takes for me to figure it out. Uh, like when we were talking about Agatha Christie, uh, in many cases, it took me quite some time. Uh, whereas for something like uh, the murder of Roger Ackroyd, I figured that one out pretty quickly. Yeah, uh, but murder on the Orient Express and, and then there were none, it took me quite some time. I actually, uh, didn't, it, I, fig I didn't find out until the very end. Oh, I remember there was only one when I was reading the, them like crazy um, as a you know a teenager. And it was one of her later books, Elephants Never Forget or something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, it was towards the end of her career. And I sort of figured it, it was the first time I ever figured out one of her books, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I was actually surprised I figured it out. Um, but that's always the fun of it. See if I can figure it out. Mm. I guess the Christie was really good in um, red hearings. And you're like, oh, mm -hmm. maybe it's this person. No, it can't be that person. Mm. So uh, they fun to read for me, you know. Um, and plus, at the age when I was like... Uh, junior high, high school, I was bullied a lot. So I just loved that it. it was a complete escape from my life. Mm -hmm. you know, I didn't live on a rich mansion. No one, you know, we didn't have servants in my house. So it was something completely different from my life, and I appreciated that. I think that the, I think the escape is what's one of the most important things of the, the better the escape the better the work and even the ability to stump you also provides a strength. Uh, I think that when a work, when a mystery is able to stump you, I think it's better than something that is predictable and obvious. I think that that's yeah. uh, a yeah. strength. I, do, I think that was one of the reasons I liked Agatha Christie so much because I could never figure it out, mm -hmm. you know. Already then, the uh, next prompt is a breakfast sandwich. 
Do you believe audiobooks make reading more convenient? Well, I am sort of hard of hearing. So I think audiobooks would be a struggle for me mm -hmm. to make sure I'm hearing it correctly. But a lot of people rely on them. Mm -hmm. And I think if you like them, then that's great. Mm -hmm. My only thing is people, I think, we use them a lot to get a higher, you know, on their reading goal. Mm -hmm. You know, because there are some people, oh, yes, and I had these three audio books. You know, mm -hmm. and I'm a slow reader. You know, I don't do like look backs, monthly look backs, because like I read one book and there's people, oh, I read 50 books this month. And I'm like, how did they do that? Um, so I think it's great if people are really into it. Mm -hmm. I've heard uh, like the one of Lincoln and the Bardo is supposed to be a great audio book mm -hmm. because it has all sorts of different people. I'm narrating mm. it. Yeah, that, that would be helpful if each of them takes on a different role. Or because a lot of it has to do with who's narrating. That's true. Yes. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, the way that people, when it comes to they've read 50 books, it's light genres or uh, methods like uh, audiobooks. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I think that to some, it, uh, to some, they benefit from audiobooks. But someone like myself, uh, they're not for me. Uh, if for some reason uh, my, uh, if for some re if something happens where my sight goes out but my hearing remains, for instance, uh, I think. I think that someone who's blind, uh, if, uh, I mean, they, if as, as an alternate to Braille, they could read an audiobook. Uh, That's one of my, true. Uh, a channel that I came across, uh, Mason in the Dark. Uh, Mason is blind. Uh, he became blind as he got older, but he is able to continue enjoying reading through audiobooks. So someone like him would benefit. Uh, and someone like myself, I prefer, uh, I, I, I like the physical book by far the best. Yeah, I had a friend who suggested, because I've, I've traveled um, a number of times, a couple of times overseas, and someone said to um, use audio books. Mm -hmm. And um, I would have to say it's probably easier than lugging a huge book in your book, in your um, suitcase. But I'm, I'm sort of like, I get more out of list reading it, mm -hmm. you know. But I think if I was going blind, I would say, okay, I would let me try this. Mm -hmm. That it would be worth it in that circumstance, uh, but because I could listen to audiobooks if I was driving as well, but I would much rather listen to music at that time because uh, that's a different kind of uh, entertainment uh, for the for that particular period. Uh, there's plenty of other times where you can read and enjoy. And I know people who go on long car rides mm -hmm. use audiobooks. And mm -hmm. I think that's great, you know. Yep, I would say whatever works best for them. Uh, the uh, next prompt is uh, Sausage, a strong series or trilogy. And for me, I went with the original books in the Millennium Trilogy, particularly... The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo and The Girl Who Played with Fire. Uh, I think that uh, the story of Lisbeth Salander, she is a remarkable uh, uh, genius uh, as far as uh, 
working as a computer hacker is concerned. And I think that uh, even though it wasn't mentioned during Steg Larson's lifetime, uh, uh, a pretty good uh, potential example of somebody with Asperger's syndrome in the uh, uh, in the world of literature and in a situation where they are able to uh, demonstrate their strength. Uh, but I have not read the uh, Lagerkrantz uh, sequels, but the series is still going forward. Uh, and I'm not sure if they were the story ideas that uh, Larson intended them to be. Uh, but I would say it is a strong series or trilogy. Well, I think that's the same with, um, I think there's someone who's been writing Jane Bond novels, mm -hmm. or there, there was after Fleming died. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if, how quite, if they're quite as good as the originals. I um, do. I would need to read them, but I don't think that, I, I'm, I led to believe that they're probably not as strong, but that's just saying that it's usually not the case. Could be wrong, but. Well, I'm going to go, because the first, last year, you know, two years ago, 2020, I did finally read from beginning to end a series, uh, a trilogy, the U.S. A trilogy by John Dos Passos. But I have to admit that was, you know, it was interesting because it takes you from like the beginning of the turn of the century to like the Great Depression. And it's three novels and they've interweaving character stories and there's a lot that he does offer, but uh, um, there's a lot of racist terms, and that sort of turned me off. I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, why are they, you know, I know that was the language back then, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and then, you know, it's, according to Dos Passos, America is only a lot of white people and one Jewish guy. Mm -hmm. He follows. Like, you know, what I like about America is we have so many different you know, people from backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go with, I'm going to start, I read the um, Trollope's um, Barchester Towers back in the day, and I really liked it. It was very funny. And now in the beginning of uh, next year, I'm doing a buddy read with mm -hmm. my friends uh, Nike and Raleigh, they're both books to grammars, and we're going to read The Warden. Mm -hmm. So I, the only book of the series I don't have is the last one now. Uh, the um, it's, it's Last Chronicle of Barisat. So I'm going to, I think I'm going to read more of that series because it's like a little town in England. In Barchester Towers, you wouldn't think it's the most funny. It's basically like uh, people squabbling inside the church, you know, within the church. You know, are we going to do a higher mass, do something fancy, or are we, are we lower mass people? Mm -hmm. And you would say, oh, that's a funny book, but it really was. It had these, um, you know, the English eccentric characters. So I'm I'm looking forward to reading more of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll have to look into each of those that you made mention to uh, the U.S. trilogy. Uh, was that when was that written? I think that was written like in the 30s. Okay, late like 20s, early 30s. I would think. Mm -hmm. Okay, then. Yeah, at that time there was still that sense of not really proceeding to caution as far as terms being used are concerned. But then again, that opens up the debate of uh, whether or not you 
use the honest language of the time or do you uh, rearrange it so that it's it sounds more appropriate and uh, well I realize I'm not into canceling anyone mm -hmm. I don't really approve of the can you know uh, mm -hmm. cancel culture because yeah. I think if you don't like a book that's mm -hmm. one thing yeah. I can't say I didn't like the book because they were well written mm -hmm. he had biographies of people yeah, you know, real people in it. Like he does little sections, like mm -hmm. with William Bryan's Jennings, and oh. so you learn a lot of history of that mm -hmm. era. Yeah, um, I think that you have to be able to preserve it. It's just a matter of being able to learn from it. Uh, if yeah. that's what, if that's the way the character spoke, then you have to be able to pres you have to be able to depict that honestly. If the writer is interjecting these kinds of things uh, in the present day, then there may be something going on. Yeah, exactly. But this is, I realized this was the time, you know, that time era. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm willing to overlook it just because, okay, I know it. It's just not my favorite thing, you know, you know, personally, but mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I mean, one person, he's over in Italy and he uses um, the you know, language towards Italians when he's in Italy. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. thinking, oh, that's not nice. And back then, that really uh, seemed to be rampant because uh, Italian immigrants were among the more, uh, they were often disdained upon uh, along with uh others from Eastern Europe. But the next prompt I have is coffee. Share any reading ritual. Okay. Um, well, it's not more a ritual, but it's something I try to do. And sometimes I suck at it. Mm. But I try to carve out time so I can read. Mm -hmm. I'm trying. I try to tell myself, okay, tonight, from like uh, seven thirty to nine, I'll read my book. Because mm -hmm. you know, um, sometimes, you know, like I know this week I've had a terrible week at work, and sometimes you just don't feel like reading, and you have to get in the mindset of, okay, I want to read this, you know, get mm -hmm. further along in this book. Sometimes I have this idea of taking your book on a date, like going to a cafe. Um, I can't now because of the weather, but I like mm -hmm. going on my porch and mm -hmm. sitting and reading in the mm -hmm. good weather. Uh, sometimes going to a cafe. Mm -hmm. um, even the park. I used to just like sitting in the park. I, I, I'm pretty much with you where it comes to that. I tried to decide, or I tried to pretty much put aside, I'm going to read for this much time in the day. Uh, and that didn't work out all the best. Uh, but, uh, and I tried to set up time where I could read somewhere. But that, does, that doesn't necessarily work out all the time either. Uh, it just comes down to being able to find uh, your hunch for reading and being able to set that time aside. Uh, I would say my reading ritual is uh, probably the, uh, the one that I can best explain is the fact that I like to use corresponding bookmarks with uh, where I got the book from, uh, in particular places like uh, independent, lesser known bookstores, uh, the secondhand bookstores, if they have bookmarks, I like to be able to incorporate that with uh, the book that I'm reading. Uh, and if, it, if I get it from a general place, I have other, I have some bookmarks uh, that 
correspond with that. Because uh, even with Barnes & Noble, uh, I don't have Barnes & Noble specific bookmarks, but I have bookmarks that are from Barnes & Noble that I will uh, incorporate. I like that idea. That's a really good idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I enjoy it. And it'll also encourage me to visit some more bookstores, uh, which I just got back into doing. I'm going to share some hauls. I'm, I'm going to do, actually, it's going to be part of a, a comeback tour in February. Oh, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. That'll be fun. Yes, indeed. Uh, the next one is, uh, the next prompt is milk, a work or writer that is fading away. And uh, for that one, I went with Louis Untermeyer, who is a, a renowned poet who is, I would pretty much source him, I would pretty much uh, deem him as the one that made America, that that he's the pioneer that made uh, American literature uh, scholarly study material because American literature started to be, they started to study it in schools, colleges around 1925. And the first sources were anthologies that uh, Louis Untermeyer put together. Uh, he himself, was a renowned poet. Uh, he was also uh, a game show panelist on uh, the, <laughs> first, the first year of What's My Line. However, uh, because of his communist ties, uh, he was blacklisted. The, he had to be removed from the show. And it pretty much put a damper on his reputation. Uh, he continued to write but uh, he, uh, you don't see much of him as far as uh, poetry in American literature anthologies is concerned, uh, but uh, his works are very thought provoking. And I think he did a lot for uh, literature and in particular American literature. I remember he used to um, edit a couple of anth poetry anthologies, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those were anthologies that he uh, that were often studied at schools. I have some. Yeah, I remember the... them. I wish I had a copy of one of those. I have at least one of them, uh, and I think I have the I have one that. Uh, is uh, an example of uh, something that was uh, studied because uh, I wanted to, I thought it had the one poem of his that I really wanted in book form, but it turns out that it was in his very first collection uh, and that was Prayer, uh, which he reads very uh, eloquently on YouTube. That's that's great answer. <laughs> mm. I chose. Um, I figured because I'm a gay man, I would choose a book um, uh, from the LGBT literature that I really really like and wish more people would read. And it's a book that came out in the late '80s called "I Look Divine" by Christopher O. And you have to remember, in the late 80s, a lot of people were writing about people dying. Mm -hmm. And this is about a, a gay man, Nicholas, who's obsessed with losing his looks. So, uh, you know, and how, you know, and it, what's interesting, it's narrated by Nicholas' brother, straight brother, and it's just very interesting how Nicholas is obsessed with looking younger. And then when he, you know, 
because when he's younger, he could pick out the better looking men and he goes all over to Rome and Paris and what have you. But then as he gets older and not quite as handsome, then he doesn't you know, have the choice of the litter. And it's after his death that Nicholas's brother is talking about his, his brother's life. So mm -hmm. I think it's a fascinating book. Um, it's called I Look Divine and okay. by Christopher Coe. Okay. That, that is very, uh, it, it's quite something that books like that. And I know uh, Ruby Fruit Jungle by Rita Mae Brown, you would think uh, with discussion about LGBTQ plus that it would have more attention than it actually has uh, and that there should be a little bit more attention that's brought upon uh, uh, particular works uh, and then leads to the question of what works should be championed uh, within the community. That's a good idea. That's a good question. I always find it a little because on Bookstagram, a lot of the gay Bookstagrammers go for, like, there's a huge amount of uh, young adult gay literature out now, much yes. more than when I was in, you know, the 70s, you know, as a teenager. And I think it's great. But then these people don't read um, Gore Vidal. They don't read... Um, James uh, Baldwin's mm -hmm. um, Giovanni's Room. Mm -hmm. They're not reading Edwin White. Uh, these are, you know, a Truman Capote, and these are classic gay writers. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, um, Rupi Fruit Jungle, um, you know, uh, Patricia Highsmith wrote. Um, the Curse of Salt or something like that. It was turned into the uh, movie um, Carol. Mm -hmm. And it was a very interesting because she wrote basically a happy lesbian story in the 50s, where okay. usually in the movies, they had to get punished. They have to die a horrible death, you know, because they were gay. That is sad. Uh unfortunate that that's what it had to come and that that's that's like with Giovanni's room uh, it was very wonderfully written but it was so miserable I didn't like any of the characters in that piece but the question is did it have to be that way in order to sell well I think it was a product I thought it was interesting because Giovanni's room it's about internalized homophobia. Mm. David really can't accept himself mm. as a gay man. Mm. You know, he has a girlfriend, but then he's not really committed mm -hmm. to her. Mm -hmm. And there are people in the community like that mm -hmm. who you know, have feelings of internal homophobia. Mm -hmm. um, so that you know, plus it sort of sets up the thing about Americans who are not accepting it, of it, especially in the fifties, mm -hmm. and Europeans where it's oh well, you know, has a much more, you know, who cares attitude. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, buddy, yeah, that is very. Uh, um, I think that if anything, things have gotten better as far as that uh, way of thinking is concerned uh, as depicted oh, in general. Oh, definitely. I mean, yes. there's so much uh, gay literature for young people. Mm -hmm. uh, and unfortunately, it's now people are trying to censor that from kids who really need that. That That is absolutely inappropriate. I don't think that people should be uh, I don't think people, I don't think any kind of literature, people shouldn't be withheld from any kind of literature unless it's uh, something that's looking to 
Uh, but then again, as far as igniting something is concerned, someone has to be able to look at it and then uh, make their make the judgment between right and wrong. So well, that's true. I was mm-hmm. lucky that my parents never banned me from reading anything. Yeah, nobody I should. See, I couldn't. We couldn't see Jaws, and we couldn't see Three's Company because that was a little too risque. But mm-hmm. I read, you know, I read, you know, lots good serious books. A lot of them on the recommendation of my mother, and they never censored anything I read, mm-hmm. which I appreciate now. And that's, I, yeah, that is a very that is something to definitely appreciate. Because I think that it's, I think you have to have that kind of faith in the individual. Uh, if if a person reacts wrong, if, if a person reacts badly to a work, that's on the per, that's on that person, not on the book. True, and just because you don't want to, as I say about the cancel cancel culture, if you don't want to read the book, that's fine. And I especially understand, like, why some people, you know, women, especially women, would not want to read a book about rape. Mm -hmm. But, you know, on the other hand, are we going to, you know, censor everything where, you know, basically literature becomes the equivalent of Garfield, Uh, the comic strip? mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't think literature should be, it should not get to that point. Alrighty then. The next prompt is orange juice. Uh, A work you should really, you really should read. And uh, the interpretation for this would be a work that you yourself really should read. But if you interpret it as a work that you feel other people should read, then you can do it in that way too. Oh, well, I chose one that I haven't read, and I probably, there are a lot of books that I should read. Mm -hmm. I keep on saying, okay, I'm going to, one year, I'm going to read all the books that I should have read. Um, The one that keeps coming in my mind is The Lord of the Flies. Oh. I know it's a classic. Um, I had a copy when I was a teenager, and for some reason, I just wasn't drawn to that book Mm -hmm. and now I'm feeling like okay maybe because part of it was about bullying I think Mm -hmm. right or wrong in my interpretation and as a teen I was bullied so I'm like I don't want to read a book about being bullied because I experienced that myself yeah it wouldn't be an escape yeah now I'm 61 I probably can read it and get something out of it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I remember that it was uh, the Simpsons spoofed it in an episode and uh, William Golding won the Nobel Prize in Literature solely based on his success with The Word of the Flies. Uh, It is something I would like to get to, uh, but uh, being an enthusiast for American presidential history, one book that I really should check out at some point is Washington Alike by Ron Chernow. Uh, and uh, I know Ron Chernow also wrote a biography about Grant that was what he was touting when he was at the uh, Morristown Festival of Books the year that I went, but I didn't go to that evening presentation because it was the night before. Uh, I did, however, see a great handful of uh, writers the next day at the main event. Uh, but and didn't he write the um, biography of Hamilton that was the basis of the musical? Yes, that was Ron Chernow as well. Uh, and and- to- I thought, oh, when I heard about Hamilton the musical, I was like, hip hop version of Alexander Hamilton. I just didn't get it. 
But mm-hmm. now I see that it's, Lynn is a genius, one of the few people I would call a genius. Mm-hmm. And so uh, one day I probably should read the, uh, his work. Mm-hmm. Sure enough. To- mm-hmm. Yeah, I have, I, I have yet to see Hamilton. Uh, but uh, I, I'll have to read that as well. Uh, but I'm not... I. I'm more into, when it comes to the Founding Fathers, I'm more into the, uh, Hamilton's more of the federalist big government, uh, big big federal government. I was more, in, I was on the opposite end, the, uh, the Democratic Republicans that were more uh, about uh, states' rights, like uh, uh, Jefferson, Madison, Payne. Uh, I would say Aaron Burr, but he has a ba- he he had that bounty on him from the duel. Uh, well, you know, one of, one of my favorite books by Gore Vidal is Burr, mm-hmm. where it's near. I think Burr is telling his life story to someone, mm-hmm. and it doesn't mention the duel, but it's not the most important part of it, but it's an excellent book. Mm -hmm. And Gordon Vidal really researched his books, Mm -hmm. his historical books, and so I highly recommend that. I'll have to look into that one. Uh, And uh, Benjamin Franklin is another founding father that I uh, would add to that list. Uh, And then, of course, George Washington, even though he eventually was classified I think even though he was independent, he would have identified as a federalist of any kind. Uh, but the next one is uh, BLT, a work that benefits or benefited from something in demand. The inspiration for the question being the fact that BLTs really uh, made their mark post World War II because of the uh, the very high, uh, the fact that bacon, lettuce, and tomato, uh, and uh, these were staples that began to flourish during the uh, during that time. Uh, but my choice for this one is uh, *The Handmaid's Tale* by Margaret Atwood, and I noticed that in 2017 with the uh, the fear and anxiety pertaining to uh, women's rights, uh, the silence breakers, the uh, and the Hulu series, The Handmaid's Tale really uh, broke out. Uh, it was it had been written uh, quite some time before, but it really made a great comeback and. I read it for a book club, uh, and then I read it for Literary Gladiators. Actually, I read it for Literary Gladiators, and it just so happened that the book club was reading it as well. Uh, but I think that's the one thing that I really have in mind when I think of a book being in demand right at the right time, and Margaret Atwood, and then and that inspired her to create the sequel, uh, The Testaments. And then, of course, it didn't hurt that there was a very popular TV series. Yeah, that was that which was I Hulu. haven't seen. That was the Hulu series. Yes, which I haven't seen. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. Even though I liked the main lady in that, because she was Peggy in Mad Men. Yeah, Elizabeth okay. Moss. Mm-hmm. What was your choice, Don? Well, my choice, I always call it the book du jour because it's like the flavor of the month type of thing. And I know Reese Witherspoon, because it had a stamp of her books club on the book. I just read, I do have my copy here. But, you know, um, where the crawdad sings and you could see her little sticker. Oh, okay. And I just read it, you know, 
I didn't think the writing was that great. Uh, I can see why it's popular because it's about this young girl growing up, you know, basically by herself in the marshland of South Carolina. Um, but I didn't think it was particularly that great of a book, oh. you know, to be honest. And I was so excited because I, you know, I thought it was like, oh, this girl, she's on trial for murder. And, you know, I thought it was going to be a better book. <laughs> and sort of at the end, I was like, oh, what? you know. And I wanted to read it because there's a movie coming out next year. Mm -hmm. So if I have ever go back to the theater, mm -hmm. you know, but it's safe to go. Maybe I'll go and see the movie. Maybe the movie will be better than the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would. That may. Yeah, I've heard very good things about where the crawdads sing, and it was a semi-finalist for the book two prize. But uh, it's unfortunate that it wasn't necessarily your thing. Uh, but that's the way things go. Uh, and, uh, but I know some people love it, mm -hmm. and some people just you know. You know, and the, the parts about nature were sort of interesting about the swamp, this marsh that she lived in. But mm -hmm. I mean, parts of it was just like, I mean, it's about this girl, you know, um, most of her family runs away from the father who's abusive and drunk. Mm -hmm. She's like only five or six that so she has to stay with him. Um... And no one seems to care about her from her family, except uh, one of her brothers does come back to find her. But uh, her mother leaves. Um, and then, you know, in the middle of the book, oh, somehow this alcoholic father died. Mm. Oh, maybe he fell into the swamp. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you're the author. You should tell me. That I, I would I kept on thinking, well, maybe. I would agree Maybe that I'll that's come a bit back. Yeah, I, I would. I agree that that's a pretty careless way to knock a character off. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> well, you know, people could have pushed him in the river. Like, what happened? Mm -hmm. You're the author. Tell me. <laughs> I mean, it depends on how it's uh, being approached. Uh, if we're only getting her perspective, she wouldn't know. But if we're getting a greater perspective, then we would have it. Then, yes, we should know. Uh, yeah. And there were things like that was like, okay, it, it, you know, when it's her first book of fiction, mm -hmm. she's written a lot about, you know, like her life in Africa, looking at nature. Um, and that came across, but um, as a book itself, I didn't think, a novel itself, I didn't think it was that great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the next prompt is uh, Hash Browns, uh, a choppy work that forms into something spectacular. Oh, I would say, I was thinking about this, and I thought of Wuthering Heights. Mm because it has an unusual structure to it. Because mm -hmm. it's one, one guy, this guy Lockwood comes to where he, Cliff, Cliff lives, and then the rest, so part of it is narrated about by the maid, you know, who works mm -hmm. for Heathcliff, and she knows the whole history, and then goes back and forth the narrative. <clears throat> mm. But then there was this part... Heathcliff goes away. When he's younger, he feels like he doesn't fit in. And he comes back when he has money. And you never know how he got his money. You know, what happened mm -hmm. to him. But the, you know, the narrative, in that way, it did work. Because, okay, we just know. Knowing Heathcliff, maybe he did something sketchy. And now he's a you know wealthy man. Yeah, Wuthering Heights is a very sketchy piece, very petty, very petty characters, uh, <laughs> and very interesting in the way that it's told. 
Uh, I was going to go with another uh, Beckett okay. work for this one, uh, but I'm going with Howl by Allen Ginsberg because Ooh. it goes, it covers a lot of ground and takes on so many different themes, but yet it really comes together and sparks a thought-provoking reaction to me, the reader. And I think that that really, I think poetry is something that really can come off as being choppy, but turn into something spectacular. And I think the fine example would be something like how that's a great that. example <laughs> mm -hmm. i didn't think about that but you're very right because mm -hmm. it's different i mean it's basically about his friend who was in the mental institution i forget his name uh it's you know but it's it's pretty much about you know uh, all the bi biographical um mm -hmm. poem mm -hmm. about his friend and uh, I'm very explicit about being gay. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, have you have you read the illustrated version? No, I haven't. I did see the movie How oh. that was out a couple of years ago, um, and that was excellent because they have an animated part of it. Mm -hmm. um, part of it is about the trial. Uh, the obscenity trial, the Ferlinghetti one, mm -hmm. and then it was also uh, talked about um, Ginsburg's life, and he's played by um, James Franco, who you would think would be too handsome to play Ginsburg. Mm. With makeup, anything is possible. True. Uh, but it works. It's, it's yes. a really interesting uh, approach to the poem. Mm -hmm. And I got a lot of the vest. The next question is Canadian bacon, Taylor ham, or pork roll? I'm going with Canadian bacon because it's still bacon. Um, I, I would say so as well. Uh, here in New Jersey, they are very... Uh, staunch as far as calling it pork roll is concerned. Uh, allegedly in North Jersey, it's Taylor ham. I call it Canadian bacon, uh, but I don't eat it to be honest. Anyhow, if I'm, you know, it's it's Canadian bacon is good on um, with eggs Benedict. Mm. I don't know if I would have it alone. Mm -hmm. Like I don't say okay, I'm I'm in the mood for Canadian bacon, mm -hmm. but I like American bacon or the bacon that you and I are probably more familiar with as bacon. Uh, the best mm -hmm. is from Peter Luger's in Brooklyn. Oh, I don't know that one. Peter Luger's Steakhouse uh, in Brooklyn. They have it's. It's pretty much the same structure for each uh, where you have the steak, you have the bacon prior to that. Uh, they have a few different uh, items, but it, it's pretty pricey and they only accept cash. Ah, uh, of but, course, me too. Uh, but, on the topic of food, uh, the next question is, what is your favorite breakfast? Well, when I go out to eat uh, with my friend Bev, we haven't done this in a while, but go to a diner. Mm. I always love sunny side eggs, um, ha hash browns, you know, just uh, hash browns, uh, yeah, hash browns. Um, home fries, that's what I meant, home fries. Mm -hmm. uh, rye toast to soak up all that yolk. And bacon. Mm. I like my bacon crispy. Oh, uh, okay. I don't like limp bacon. Mm -hmm. My yeah, I've always, 
I said, I would like to try. I wouldn't mind trying an English breakfast, but then mm -hmm. I wouldn't have to eat for a whole year, I think. That's a pretty enticing meal, though. You you have yourself covered. You, you, you're covering all of the breakfast food groups. Eggs, bacon, uh, a starch, uh, and a vegetable, too. True. But... Uh, what is your favorite? Uh, my favorite breakfast is uh, cannoli pancakes, uh, which would be uh, a chocolate chip pancake uh, with cannoli cream and maple syrup. And then a side of bacon would be a bonus as well. Uh, but I think once you have Peter Luger's bacon, you feel very spoiled as far as your experience is concerned because their bacon is, uh, it's got the consistency, it, it, it's solid like a meat. Yeah, I'm getting hungry. Mm. Yeah, it, it's- And for bacon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like something I've never had before. And it tastes just like the bacon. It's, it's bacon in the form of, it's got, it's, got that consistency of solid meat as opposed to a strip of meat. Uh, That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I do like, I also like waffles with ice cream, but. Waffles with ice cream. Yes. I never had that. I like put a, put some vanilla ice cream on top. I had it at the diner before. Uh, sometimes I've made it myself, but I, but I like it fresh. I like a, I like a homemade fluffy pancake or a, uh, a waffle with a great sense of consistency. Uh, I don't like Bisquick or Ega or any of that stuff in a box or frozen. Not for me. Well, I will agree that homemade waffle is good. Mm -hmm. My sister-in-law makes as a great waffle maker, and she's fantastic. And there was a hotel I went in San Francisco with my mother, and it was a big breakfast buffet. It was one of the greatest things, uh, and breakfast was free, so. Mm. And so uh, they had a waffle maker, and mm -hmm. that was fun to make your own waffles. <laughs> the thing is, with waffles, I'll have it with peanut butter. Oh, okay. I think you have, being a diabetic, I can't have, you know, um, real sugar, real uh, syrup. Mm -hmm. that's, un but, that's unfortunate, but understandable. Yeah, well, you know, uh, I'm used to it. It's funny because my... Endocrinologist um, nutritionist told me to do that: have yeah. waffles with pink, with peanut butter. Mm -hmm. And then he asked me, what, "What do you have for breakfast?" I said, "That." Who told you that? Your own nutritionist. <laughs> I'm glad he's retired. Uh, mm -hmm. And some other interesting breakfast things uh, about me are. I despise cereal, and uh, I, yeah, I don't, I, I think cereal is disgusting, uh, but, and I, I like to drink orange juice. Uh, uh, I think that uh, I'm, I'm the only person in my household that will uh, drink orange juice, uh, but uh, I had apple cider for breakfast uh, recently, and I think that's good too, but it's usually a glass of orange juice in the morning. See, I don't like our, you know, it comes to my mother used to have the concentrate. Mm -hmm. Like in the 60s and 70s, you would get the frozen kind. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, she always picked the concentrate with pulp. Oh, yeah, I don't like and pulp. It turned me off. Mm hmm. I like no pulp. So. Me too. Mm -hmm. But uh, 
And then finally is you're invited to brunch. Who do you tag? Uh, did you have anybody in particular you had wanted to tag on? I'm just going to tag um, two of my friends on Bookstagram because oh. I'm not sure who's still on uh, Booktube. Okay. But my friends Raleigh and Nike, they know who they are. Okay. The people I'm going to be tagging. Try to do a tag. but, the people I'm going to be tagging know who they are as well. Uh, any contributor that's going to be joining our channel for the restructure in January, I nominate and encourage them to complete this tag, especially if they're looking for an idea for a video. I think this would be a great one to do. Uh, and uh, we have a great team coming together. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to what we have in store. Uh, but I'm just, aside from that, it's going to be anyone who is interested. Uh, I'm going to tag everybody uh, because I think that they'll have a ball with this particular tag. I think that this really take, uh, this really took a great uh, formation. It was a fun tag to do. And I really am happy to have had you uh, on board. I really appreciate you taking part. Uh, and I had a fun time. I did too. Already. I did too. Already then, thank you for tuning into this video and I hope you join us next time for uh, some more videos here on Literary Gladiators. For now, keep reading.